Again, welcome. It is good to have you here. It is always good to gather as a community to have conversation, and that is our goal for tonight. Uh, but to get us started, it is probably good just to have some primer material. So we've asked a couple people to share uh, what they know uh, with us, and we've asked them to keep it to five minutes. Um, I know at least one of them might go longer, Bill, um, but we'll try to keep them to that time. <laughs> So the first person we'll have come up is uh, the Reverend Bill Curlin Hackett, who is the director of the Interfaith Task Force on Homelessness, and that organization's been around since uh, a long time, and he's been a part of it since 04. Uh, they work in King and Snohomish counties to create the political will to end homelessness. The group held its 15th political will conference in September 2015 called One by One. In 2013, uh, the ITFH received an Innovative Program Award for its Seattle Scofflaw Mitigation Project and has been core to the safe parking development. And we'll hear more about that. Bill? Thank you, Tor. Uh, good to be with you all. Um, so everything I know in five minutes, and I won't get there, um, a disclaimer. Um, and maybe some of the questions that may come up as I talk are things you can ask somebody else on the panel later uh, because they may also know the answer. Uh, ITFH has been around since 2001. There's some handouts that we brought out on the table, including the myths booklet, and my contact info is all on the back of that, but if, you, if they run out and you need my contact info, let me know. Um, we function in Seattle, uh, King County, uh, Snohomish County, and mostly started as education and advocacy, and now have been doing a lot of direct service, especially around those with the unsheltered, with other groups that have had a longer history doing that, uh, trying to support them and uh, give everybody a safe place. Um, half the time I end up speaking, I forget to tell you that the two most important things to remember when you get involved in this are safety. Safety is number one all the time for the people who are trying to find a safe place and for those of you who are helping and listening listening to each other, listening to people who are in harm's way. Uh, don't fill their heads with remedies that you think are appropriate for them. Listen. Give them the regard of the person they are. You know, and, and that is their own capacity will begin to kick in. So there's been a 10-year plan. It just ended this year. We now have a four-year strategic plan. There's an FAQ out on the table, frequently asked questions about what that is. It's called All Home. Uh, it has its blessings and curses, problems. Um, you may hear more about that or not tonight, but that's the plan that we're going forward with for now. We know that we have an enormous homeless problem. If you've been paying attention, we have a state of emergency declared in King County and in the city of Seattle. Uh, we counted 3,772 people unsheltered on the streets, more than 10,000 counting those in shelter and transitional housing. That's an undercount. Those are the people we know about. And we think that number could be as high as two to two and a half to three times as high. We just see it everywhere we go. And in the schools, we have more than 32,000 school children, K-12, self-identified as homeless. And we know we probably have more of those because not everybody self-identifies. And they're not homeless every night of the year, but they're in and out of homelessness. And, they're, and those numbers don't jive. You can't just say, OK, how do they fit together? They don't fit together very well. It's very hard to determine exactly how many folks are homeless. Because just like all of us, they have the capacity to be mobile. It, it's a free country. And, and so their capacity to live as free beings is very important. So I want to just spend a little bit of this uh, remaining whatever minute and a half, two minutes I have left, to talk about some of the things faith communities do. And I think Rob is going to talk about some of the things that may not be happening or are unique to this area across the top of the county. Um, Tepmo Beth Am, for example, does a program called Homeless to Renter. And what they do is they work with Jewish Family Services, and they get the first and last for a family so they can get into housing after they've been screened. It's a good idea. It's a great program. It's more than 10 years old. Housing, Ronald United Methodist, at the other end of this long strip across, um, broke ground. They have a big hole, as Rob says, uh, on housing in partnership with Hope Link and Compass. And that's the use of their property that is just a great gift. And other congregations have done that. Seattle Mennonite, right over in Lake City, has done that. Uh, St. Luke's Lutheran is about to do that down in Bellevue. Um, 
on top of which St. Luke's Lutheran also does a shelter program and a day center program for Sophia Way called Sophia Place, a use of part of their facility that didn't get built out when they put a new sanctuary in. Congregations for the Homeless operates winter shelter, day center, and a rotating shelter program in Bellevue. And that's a pathway with a high success rate into housing because those who enter that program are usually people cap capable of working. Um, SHARE is represented here tonight. SHARE does, uh, I have lost track, 13, 14 indoor shelters at faith communities overnight. They run Tent City 3 and Tent City 4 um, and have had the history of being the pioneers leading those Tent City efforts and pretty much, not always, but pretty much with faith community partners. Um, safe Parking, Lake Washington United Methodist. The keynote speaker was Kelly Domino, the Methodist, about their safe parking program which, you know, we have a keynote, uh, a copy of that keynote if you want to uh, get on our mail list. Um, you can listen to Kelly on YouTube, uh, describe the program that's evolved there over six or seven years now. Other congregations throughout Seattle and even on the east side, Our Savior Lutheran, are also doing safe parking programs. Um, I've gotten, just for example, it's Tuesday, this week since Monday, two days, I've gotten at least eight calls from people living in their vehicles. These numbers are just escalating. And what's really happening is we're beginning to see more of those who are in harm's way and hear from them and find out how entangled they are in problems. Um, in advocacy, there's the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance, not a faith organization, but Faith Action Network has taken on homelessness as one of its items. Um, there's guests here from Camp Unity East Side from Tent City 4, I think, are here, right? Uh, Tent City 3 is also part of that network. Nicholsville, United We Stand is right over in Shoreline. Uh, so there's many tent cities of varying sizes, hosted by faith communities. You know, faith communities have the right as part of their mission to host the homeless on their property. There's state law and federal law. Des Moines just passed an ordinance, for example, that said you can't have a tent city within 1,000 feet of a school. Well, that's probably going to get struck down because that denies a faith community the right to host. That's a federal right that you have to host the homeless on your property. And least restrictive permitting is all that can be used. Um, Seattle, Seattle U has a faith and family homelessness program. Some of you may have done their poverty immersion workshops that they're doing. They're also trying to get engaged in other ways, especially around families who are homeless. Seattle Union Gospel Mission has partnered with many on the outside of Seattle. They're part of this group, Kent Hope, that I've been part of for almost four years now. They're going to start a Kent Hope Resource Center in Kent, which is a full-service center to get off the streets, including a day center. You can't just think about a tent city or about a shelter. Where do folks go during the day? How can they begin to rebuild their, their lives and their capacity through a day center, someplace where they can be safe and warm? They use libraries and other places like that. But faith communities have, you know, a lot of empty space often during the day. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm a United Church of Christ pastor, so I've spent enough time in faith communities to know that we're not always full during the day. So uh, think about how you might use your property. And we're always available as are others. I know the director of Imagine Housing is here somewhere. Um, there he is. Um, Imagine Housing builds. They used to be St. Andrew's Housing. They build a lot of properties, uh, housing on various faith community and other properties. So these are the kind of people that can help trigger your thinking, just so that you begin to think innovatively. And that's what the state of emergency that's been declared requires. Um, we've got a problem here on the West Coast. It is not true the rest of the country, but it is absolutely true on the West Coast. And so we want to find a way for all of us to think more collaboratively and to think of using our resources for what I usually say are the fulfillment of the two commandments, the greatest commandment, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. If you just hold on to that and think of what it would be like to love your neighbor as yourself, when I'm housed tonight and someone's not, how much am I, what's my love really worth if I'm not really finding a way to help house the person who's not housed? And it's not an overnight answer, but it can be um, something that each one of us or collectively, and I think it sounded like a radio station, K-Big, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I'm going to close there because I think I'm probably into eight minutes and I'm already going to get crit crit critiqued for that. So thank you very much. If you have questions, come up to me afterward. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, show your appreciation.